One day, I was sitting with Ramesh when I was reading the magazine Mountain Path. In the magazine, there was an article by Jean Dixon on Maharaj, Nisargadatta Maharaj, and his book, I Am That. Ramesh was very interested in reading it. And he told me to read it and to go and see how Maharaj was. It was actually as good as he made it out to be in the, mag in the article. So I went to and met Maharaj. And I found Maharaj every bit as good, if not more. That's what I told Ramesh about it. And Ramesh had also asked me to ask Maharaj whether he could come and see him. Because Ramesh was not a guru hopper. He had a guru for many years. So he asked Maharaj's permission to come and see him, even though he had a guru of his own earlier. So Maharaj told me that Ramesh could have a hundred gurus. He was always welcome to come and meet him. So I told Ramesh that, and I took Ramesh to Maharaj. And when Ramesh met Maharaj, Maharaj said, oh, said, oh you have come. That was how the first meeting started. And we were attending his meetings regularly in the mornings. He attended his evening meetings also. But I was with him only in the morning meetings. And after a short time, a lot of foreigners used to come who would speak in English. And Maharaj would speak in Marathi. There were one or two translators who could translate Maharaj talking to English. So when Ramesh was there, Ramesh also became one of the translators. And in the course of time, he was known as one of the best translators. Many of the foreigners preferred to wait till Ramesh became the translator when they started asking questions. So this went on for some time. And towards the end of his life, Maharaj had a trouble speaking. He had in his throat, some problem. So one day when he was speaking, he couldn't, so he asked Ramesh, that he would to speak for him so that he could go and take some rest. Everybody was stunned, including Ramesh, that he was asked to speak. So when Maharaj went, nobody asked Ramesh any questions, nor did Ramesh talk to them. So when Maharaj returned, he found everything quiet. He was quite irritated, although he didn't say so. A few days after that, after the talks, Maharaj was sleeping in his room and we were sitting around him. Ramesh and in that third person. Suddenly, Ramesh, uh, Maharaj woke up and started shouting, why don't you talk? <laughs> so we understood what he meant. Because, we, and that was how the whole thing started. But even then, after a few days after Maharaj passed away, but even then, there was nothing Maharaj, Ramesh could do. He was not there to talk and invite people to come and talk to him. He lived his life as before. But then it was the grace of Maharaj that did the trick. Some people from Vajreshwari who had read Ramesh's article on Maharaj came and met him. And after they heard him talk, more and more people started coming to him from there. That's how the whole thing started. It was all by the grace of Maharaj. And one day a person from California, an American, I forget his name right now, he was referred to Ramesh by a Chetana book house. That was how he came and met Ramesh. And he was so impressed by Ramesh's talks that he said that in California, he is in for California, and in California, people from all over the world, spiritual people, come there too. And they are welcome there. And the people from they can't come here and listen to But he would very much like them to hear Ramesh and learn from him. So he said, if he arranges for his talks there, and is coming there, and he stays there, would he come? I said, he would not mind at all. He would welcome going there. So he bought a ticket one year later in Air India, <laughs> and gave him the ticket. And surprisingly, Air India never gives a ticket like that. But in this case, they gave him. That's one of the miracles. So one year later, he arranged the talk. And one year later, Ramesh went on that ticket. And that was how the whole thing started. When I was about 12 or 13 years old, I read an art, 
read Paul Brenton's book, Search in Secret India. And that was the first time I came across Ramana Maharshi and his teachings. Even at that early age, I was impressed. In that early age, I was impressed with Advaita. So I wanted to meet Raman Maharshi. Unfortunately, I did not go. And by the time I was 18, he had passed away. So I missed a glorious chance of meeting Raman Maharshi. But I was interested in the subject all along in Advaita. I would read about it also. So when I met Maharaj and his talks, I took to it like a duck took to water. There is no resistance on my part. Unlike so many others, where there is resistance. Because the ego is so powerful, they can't accept that they are being lived. The ego prevents them from thinking like Which in my case was not so. So I could take immediately to Maharaj's teachings on Advait. The f most important thing about going to Maharaj, what is, it was a glorious release for me. Because all the time, I, my life has been a series of blunders. And I was living a life a series of self-contempt for all this. When I met Maharaj, he convinced me that I was being lived. I was not living. It was not by choice what I was doing. What I was doing was being lived by me. So that gave me a big release. So I ceased to condemn myself for what I did or I did not do. So that the biggest release for me was meeting Maharaj was release from self-contempt. That was a major breakthrough for me. That I was being lived, not lived. And from that the whole thing started. Then I realized that I, this, I was not this human being which I thought who was with free will, but I was something far different. So Maharaj asked me, through Maharaj I learned to analyze myself. Why do I think I'm a human being? Because I have this human body. And I have the human desires as a human being. Then I have this ego or personality, different from others, which separates from others, this ego. All these things makes me a human being. So when I took to Advaita, Advaita, when I consider myself a human being, in, in spiritual matters, there are two philosophies. Philosophy of Advaita and philosophy of Dvait. In Dvait is God and me, as a human being. So Dvait accepts me as a human being with, with free will that I think I am. All the religions belong to Dvait. And they tell me how to live, as, to be nearer to God, as a human being, which they accept me as. Advait is exact contrary. Advait questions my very belief that I'm a human being with free will. It starts from that. So Advait asks me, why do I think I'm a human being? Because I have this human body. So Advait says, you have this human body, just which takes you from birth to death. It's your vehicle. From, if you move in a car, that's your vehicle. Why do you identify with the vehicle? You're not the vehicle. You're that which is aware of the vehicle. Similarly, you are that which is aware of this body. You are not this body. You are that which is aware of the body. So how can you be a human being? As a human being, I have desires, I have hopes, aspirations. So they, these are all which arise and set within you. You are not them. You are only aware of them. So you are that which is aware of them. But then I am this personality, Chaitanya Sarasya Balsekar. Of course I am the individual which separates me from others. So even this person, so-called personality of ego is nothing but the subject end of every thought. Subject end of every thought is I am. I am thinking. So I am thinking, subject of every thought is the ego. Every thought that you think creates the ego. Ego rises and sets with each thought. But the thoughts come so fast, the egos come so, that you think it is one ego. It is not one ego. It is the ego rises with every thought. In a movie, you have so many picture frames. They go so fast that you think it's one continuous film. It's not. Similar, you think you have one continuous ego, which is not so. Your ego is something which rises and sets with every thought. Ends. So that is the ego. And being an ego, it is an illusion. Because you are 
that which is real. The ego is the illusory nature. That behind the ego is what you are. And what am I? The impersonal presence. All these thoughts and ego cannot arise in, they have to arise somewhere. And that they have to arise in the impersonal presence that you are. Impersonal presence. What is the impersonal presence? Is the I am. I don't have to think that I am existing. I know I am. I don't have to think I am. Prior to thought, I know I am. That is the impersonal presence prior to thought. And that is identified consciousness. What is identified consciousness? Consciousness, not even being aware of itself, becomes aware of itself. When it becomes aware of itself, the manifestation rises in the con as an appearance of consciousness in consciousness. In these manifestations, appearance appear and disappear. And when each appearance appears, consciousness is reflected in each appearance as identified consciousness. And this identified consciousness is the I am. This identified consciousness may be a germ, a, an animal, or a human. In a human being, it is the I am, identified consciousness. So identified consciousness and I am are one. So it is there so long as the body is there. When the body dies, what happens? The identified consciousness ends and becomes conscious, impersonal consciousness again. This is Advaita in pure form. In Dwait, no, when the body dies, you become a spirit, you go totally different. Totally different. So Advait starts where Advait ends. When this body dies, this identified consciousness, I am, ends. And impersonal consciousness continues. It is always impersonal consciousness and identified. The wave is always an appearance in the water. Just as the identified consciousness is an appearance in impersonal. So when the wave disappears, it disappears into the water. When the body dies, the ident when identified disappears, it disappears into impersonal consciousness. There is no it's like, uh, remaining, nothing remaining after that, unlike in Dwight. So there is a vital difference. So in uh, Dwight, I am always consciousness, whether identified or not. Here and I am, I am impersonal consciousness. All pervading, all knowing, all, all pervading, all powerful. Here and I am. Although I'm not consciously aware of it. I'm not conscious because of the body. The body makes the difference. Stops me from being, knowing what I am. That's it. When somebody asks a stupid question, worthy, mind will get very annoyed. So I say, go out, <laughs> out. <laughs> and if the man didn't go, mind will say, mum. Till the other people force him to get out. <laughs> and mind was uncompromising. He is stuck to it, unlike Raman Maharshi. You come here, you think on this, otherwise go. <laughs> That's the difference between Raman Maharshi and Maharaj. So there's no question of misunderstanding what Maharaj taught. Totally uncompromising. Advait in pure form. And best part of it is this Advait experience, not through books. Maharaj always says, I have not read any books, you know. What I'm telling you, what I've experienced not from what I have read. That's a total different with other people who, who only repeat what they have read. Here it was stated what it experienced. It was experiential statements of Maharaj. And that made all the difference. So many times Maharaj said, here I am un uneducated, I hardly did my matric. And you know, all this PhDs and all from all of this professor, that all they come to listen to me, <laughs> look at the wonder. 
<laughs> Look at the wonder if it all. <laughs> So it is a, here I am talking to you, here you, you are listening to me. Who is doing the talking, who is doing the listening? Consciousness. Is pure consciousness which is doing the talking? Is consciousness doing the listening? Is all consciousness all the while? And nothing but consciousness. So consciousness is all as all. So that was fundamental teaching of Maharaj. One without a second. And I am being lived. One I read about, about being lived. Ramesh also always concerned, we do not live but we are being lived. <coughs> The best example of this being lived, I got from Kabir. Kabir was a great poet saint. He was also a believer in Advait, and he lived Advait. Kabir was a weaver by profession. So one day he received a big order, he was busy weaving. A friend of his came to meet him. So he said, Kabir ji, you both kaam, kaam So Kabir looked up from his work and said, Ram kare so kaam. Hum bethi aram. <laughs> and then went back to his work. See, he lived Advait. He was working very hard, but knew all the time it was not he. He was being only lived to do it. The principle in practice, being lived. The Ram kare sukam, hum bethi aram. <laughs> that in one sentence it explained everything. And wait. What I am doing is planting a seed in you. Don't bother about it. Let the seed grow by itself. And after some time, you will find the results. You will know everything that you think you don't know. I accepted that. And true enough, after a couple of years, Suddenly, I started understanding what Maharaj was saying and what even Raman Maharaj was saying, which earlier was difficult for me to follow. But the seed had started giving results. So, what Maharaj said was perfectly true. After that, I could understand so many things that you could not understand. So what Maharaj was doing was planting seeds. <laughs>